Hi, my name is Sally Funk, and thank you for joining us here at this event. Today, I'll walk us through and demonstrate how a threat intelligence platform from Eclectic IQ can be the central component of your cyber threat intelligence program. How it relates to your everyday operations now more than ever. How to hunt for ongoing threats and proactively protect your organization's assets. As the threat intelligence landscape evolves, it's equally important that organizations evolve with it and make sure to be equipped with the right tools and intelligence beyond IOCs. I'm here with my colleague Hero, who will kick it off with a presentation. I'm Hero Schoutenek. Thank you also for joining, and thank you, Ali, for the start of the session. I would like to present a couple of slides to provide you with some context to Eclectic IQ and our tip called Eclectic IQ Platform, and the demos Ali will do. Eclectic IQ is a Dutch provider of applied cyber threat intelligence technology and added value services, with a headquarter in Amsterdam and some offices in other regions, and here in the Middle East, working with a strategic value-added distributed CyberNight and a network of about 25 local partners. We enable governments and commercial sector organizations to bootstrap a threat intelligence practice and the communities they are part of. Wherever they are in their CTI journey, Maybe at the beginning, maybe they used already an IOC aggregator available in the market. Wherever they are, we can help them building their practice, the technology and expertise. Eclectic IQ is founded by analysts and our solutions are made by and made for analysts. So very analyst centric and empowering them to take back control of the threat reality of the organizations they work for and mitigate exposure accordingly. You can find analysts working with our solutions in units or departments called SOC or CERT or Fuser Center, Intel and Hunting Teams or ISACs. Eclectic IQ is an active contributor to OASIS and the open standards for cyber threat intelligence, STICS and TAXI from the very beginning because with our analyst background we do believe in the power of open, open data models and open architecture. Both are key principles for our solutions. Our vision on CTI and our innovative solutions are recognized well by customers and by the market with numerous sector-specific awards, as you can see at the bottom and the logos at the right side. Our portfolio consists of six elements, with the platform Ali will demonstrate today at the top. Following clockwise, we develop platform integrations to, for instance, SIEM solutions, such as Splunk, QRadar, ArcSight, LogRhythm and more and to other operational security technologies such as orchestration, network or endpoint detection and prevention. Our team of analysts in our fusion center helps customers with aggregating and producing intelligence and also with training and coaching via our academy and value-added services. We recently joined forces with Polylogix, a creator of endpoint and cloud workload threat detection and response technologies. We will use our combined capabilities to reimagine how security analysts detect, hunt, and respond to sophisticated threats. What is cyber threat intelligence? There are multiple definitions, but here in the title we have a short one that includes the essential elements. Cyber threat intelligence is all about knowing what your adversaries do and using that information to improve decision making. That is beyond aggregating IOCs and sending them to your SIEM, which is often a starting use case for organizations. The knowing here in this definition should include all pieces or forms of data or evidence to understand the full picture of threats to your organization and the adversaries, their motives, tactics, techniques, procedures they are using, the fingerprints or IOCs and the possible course of actions as you can see in the nice graph left with the real sticks icons. You will see the same sticks icons in the graph analysis Ali will demonstrate, and this provides the analyst insight with just a glance compared to color dots and lines only. A threat intelligence platform or TIP, such as Galactic IQ platform, enables the analyst producing intelligence for a variety of use cases on strategic, tactical, and operational level. The intelligence process is often pictured as a cycle with five steps called the intelligence cycle. Rather than giving you a mini lecture about it, I would like to make it more concrete with the four steps here, starting with the ingestion of different forms of data from different sources 
into the knowledge base based on the Stix data model and to enable the analysts creating a more comprehensive view of the threat landscape. Then the technology supports the analyst make the connection between seamlessly unrelated dots and validate their hypothesis quicker. By eliminating repetitive mundane aspects of the customer's analyst, enabling them to respond faster to incidents and other intelligence requests, and to do where they are hired for, intelligence analysis, and less data engineering. Organizations can tackle cyber threats alone. Therefore, making it easier for them to consume and share intelligence with partners is very important. All from the Unified Customer Threat Intelligence Knowledge Base. Enough intro and context. It's time for Ali's demo. We have split it in two parts. The first part is about proactive discovery of potential threats, while the second part is more responsive and about responding to inciting coming from a scene. So in the first part, Ali will start with the dashboard and then browse for new data and insights in the full knowledge base using search queries and then see the results regarding a COVID-19 report made by Eclectic IQ Fusion Center. Next, we will go deeper into discovery rules and explain the entity types and you might recognize sticks here. Then it's time for the powerful graph analysis of Eclectic IQ platform and how you can add context to it and how to create entities manually based on new insights during the analysis process. Intelligence within the platform can be disseminated as human readable threat intelligence in the form of reports and as machine readable threat intelligence in the form of feeds and integrations security technologies. Ali will demonstrate how to create a report and how to add to a workspace and how to use workspaces for collaboration and sharing. I'd like to show you our platform, discuss its importance to an organization, and walk through not only features, but delve into actual work done on a day-to-day -day basis by analysts around the world, and how we do it on our platform. This is the Eclectic IQ Threat Intelligence Platform, which is an analyst-centric workbench for the aggregation, curation, and dissemination of threat intelligence concerning your organization, or organizations you may be responsible for protecting. This platform is intended to be used as a central component for your threat intelligence program and will consolidate or let you consolidate and maximize the value of your other CTI resources, such as threat intelligence feeds. We also support integrations with popular security tools, such as Seams or Source, like Splunk, Curadar, Phantom, or Demisto. When you first log in, you arrive at this dashboard seen here. This dashboard highlights some useful statistics and trend data for the intelligence within the platform. There are some simple metrics displayed showing the number of individual entities currently in the platform, along with a highlight of how many have been ingested in the last 24 hours. So what you see here in black is historic. This basically shows you how many entities have been ingested from the beginning of this instance, so this uh, setting of this platform. And what you see in green, that you know basically defines what's been shown in the last 24 hours. There are also a number of widgets which include previews of some platform features such as the discoveries and tasks. We'll discuss those uh, shortly. Moving on from here, if we wanted to see all the intelligence that's in here, we'll move over to the browse view. Now in the browse view, we're able to see all the data that's been ingested into the platform from the various threat intelligence feeds, uh, which we have configured. Our search feature is built on Elasticsearch, so if you've worked with it, you will recognize the same Lucent search syntax you would have used there. This allows you to build queries for any values contained in specific fields for each entity, as well as Boolean logic combining operators like AND, OR, and NOT to build complex queries. Our Query Builder lets you explore the different fields you can query, as well as their purpose. So if I were to show you here, but just by typing data or clicking on it, you'll see that it starts coming up with all different type of uh, options, including if you uh, hover over the tooltip, it'll also tell you what it's used for and how it's used. What's also important to know is that we also provide a search history, which allows, you, uh, allows the user to quickly vi revisit previous searches without having to rewrite them with every time or keep a list of useful searches outside of the platform. So as you can see here, these are the different uh, search queries we've already performed on this one. So if we were to run a quick search, 
you'll see that we can filter for very specific results depending on the fields we choose. Let's search for any report entities uh, and we'll limit our search uh, results to a specific source that we're ingesting intelligence from. So in this case, it's going to be the Eclectic uh, Fusion Center. And we'll add the keywords COVID and also look for phishing to focus our results about the current pandemics that we're all facing. And let's see how that um, you know progresses, because if we can notice now, we have over 5 million entities that are actually currently showing in the search, and we want to narrow that down. So let's start by typing data.type. And you can see the system is already telling me, is this what you mean? Yes, it is. Thank you. And I want to say that I'm looking for a report entity. There we go. Uh, I'm going to add the add uh, operator. I'm going to say that I'm looking for a source name. Uh, and it's going to pop up and show me which source would you like. And these are the sources that I'm currently ingesting into this platform. So I'm going to select the Eclectic IQ Fusion Center. What I'd like to do is I'm going to say and. I'm looking for COVID. And I'm also looking for phishing. If I hit enter there, you'll see that we went from 5 million and more entities to down just to 20. So let's take a look at this entity in detail and see what it actually shows us. So to begin with, let's select the very first report in the results list. On the right side, I've got the details pane open, which can be opened for any entity in the platform to explore all available information. Phishing is a threat I think we can all relate to and both uh, our existing customers and no doubt your own users and customers are all at a high risk uh, at the moment given the current global uh, crisis. Everybody's been uh, working from home, no longer using uh, work resources behind corporate infrastructure, using new technologies as well as personal devices. It's a unique situation that has really broadened the threat landscape and a lot of malicious actors have been taking advantage of this. So for a report entity, we're expecting a good amount of detail uh, to give us context uh, on the threat. We already know from the uh, search that this report concerns phishing and the theme is the coronavirus pandemic. And the detail pane will give us the remaining information, including common metadata like timestamps, tags, the source, and more unique values such as uh, TLP or traffic light protocol, which relates to the sharing of intelligence either internally or with third parties. So from here, we can actually see the tags, we can see the estimated time, information sources where this is all gathered from, and of course the sources. So we've seen that users can make use of searches to quickly find things they're interested in. But if this is a daily process, they can configure discovery rules. These are saved searches that are run on a regular basis and any newly matching intelligence is displayed in the dedicated discovery view. We saw this at the beginning when we first logged in. So this is our discovery widget that will show you entities as they pop up. And these entities are actually found through the discovery rules that we've configured. Let's just go to our uh, configuration for uh, discovery rules. So here we are. This view is essentially the first port of call of analysts using this platform. As new intelligence comes in from your feed, these rules will allow your analysts to filter through the noise and find the content relevant uh, to their investigations. Some examples we see here are simple rules to return any intelligence matching specific words such as the threat actor TA505 or intelligence that's, let's say, uh, tagged with specific areas of industry or perhaps alerts from an integrated scene tool which need immediate investigation. Any intelligence you see in here can be processed using the options on the right. So let me just show you that. So uh, essentially, we can uh, basically just click on here, and that'll allow you to remove intelligence from discovery if it's not interesting, or first add it to a data set to further investigate. Of course, outside of these entities, uh, you can also create your own. The menu here on the left lets you create specific entities capturing metadata and relationships to other entities. The entities you'd be most familiar with are IOCs, indicators, and their observables, which are your machine-readable values such as IP addresses, domain names, file hashes, etc. And then you have TTPs, tactics, techniques, and procedures, which are intended to capture malware and tools and the attack patterns used by malicious actors. Threat actors themselves are represented by the threat actor uh, entity. Uh, which we have here, of course. Uh, then we have CVEs and uh, system vulnerabilities are captured with the exploit target entity. 
Also in this list are incidents, campaigns, and course of actions uh, which track time-bound events and see use in uh, remediation and response use cases. Finally, sightings, which are pr uh, produced by our uh, integrations with seams and source systems, are essentially alerts that intelligence from our platform has been seen matched to data in one of these tools. Okay, so we've covered searching, as well as creating entities. So let's go back to the report we found and go into a little bit more details. So I'm going to click on Browse. We'll see that it's still open here. So one thing to note is that for any entity in the platform, we can load it into a graph and explore relationships between our entities, discovering intel uh, you know, additional intelligence that may be related, but most importantly, add context to the ingested threat intelligence and actually see what how everything is connected to each other. If I click on the Neighborhood tab, we can see uh, in this tab that there is a preview to show us related entities. But rather than go and work on this one, let's go and load uh, the entity into the graph directly and explore it ourselves. So I'll go back to overview. And uh, what I'll do is if I click on the icon here to the right side, I can click on add to graph. This will add it uh, to the graph that I have open. And here we have it, the phishing attack uh, exploiting coronavirus. If I were to open this up, and I click uh, on the view more, we can actually see the full report, including some details about hashes, uh, the sticks uh, uh, relevant ideas. We have the findings and links to that, uh, including quite a comprehensive uh, discovery that's been going on. Now, of course, what we wanna do is from here, we might wanna discover other things. So we wanna pivot information. And uh, relationships are intended to infer a lot of context about any given entity. And some entities really require relationships to provide sufficient detail to an investigation. So what I'm going to do here is uh, within the graph itself, uh, maybe I should also explain that the graph is a core component of our platform and is intended as a primary investigation tool for users. If we right click on any entity in the graph, we'll get a context menu. So if I do that there, I'm right clicking, we'll get a context menu. So this menu here allows me to uh, create a couple of options. So what we're gonna do is we wanna load entities just to see what's going on. So if I click on load all entities, instantly we go from just having one phishing email, or one phishing report, uh, to quite a few other things. And immediately we can see that there's a number of relationships to different entity types, and these uh, will help us to understand this threat. From this report, we can see one relationship to another report, which may contain more information about this threat or link it to even another threat. Uh, so we have here an internal report. We have one that goes into uh, the German public services hit with the Imotet attacks uh, and so on. This second report describes German public services being hit in targeted Imotet attacks. So perhaps the Imotet malware is being delivered as part of a phishing attack uh, described in our first report. Again, we can click to access the details. So just like that. And we can view the full content to read more about, you know, how and what has been discovered. It also shows us more about taggings and the references, which sources this is coming from, of course and understand the relationships. We also see some other relationships, including a campaign, which one uh, is over here, multiple TTPs, some indicators, and even a CVE exploited target. Um, at just this quick glance, we can quickly understand what this threat consists of, how it may relate to other threats, and uh, this was just the first uh, set of relationships. We can also manipulate the structure of the graph to better visualize our data. And uh, we have a number of different methods that you can see from up top here. So, I mean, we can look at the standard model, which will shift things around uh, this way. If we click on, let's say, hierarchy, it basically gives us the way that these files relate to each other in a specific manner. My personal favorite is structural. What this does uh, essentially is show you entities that are linked and subbed out from each other. So essentially for our phishing uh, uh, report that we have here, um, how it links to uh, the campaign and which attack pattern that has been used in connection with the hash that's there. Everything else that's orphaned or left out is then basically spread out to the different sides. And if we look at the uh, hash that is relating to um, our phishing report and open that up, we also see that this is essentially something that's been deployed and dropped through a downloading system from a, a malicious Word document. 
Now since this is an indicator, we expect this to contain observables representing the hash file. These observables may be unique. So if I click on observables, we can see that there are indeed three observables here. And these are unique within our platform, which means that any other intelligence within the platform that describes or relates to these observables will be linked. This is a fundamental part of our platform and is how you can pivot and find relationships between entities from different intelligence sources. If we load entities related to these hatches and check the details for each one, we can see that they're all from different intelligence sources configured within this platform. So if I were to click on filters and scroll down here to sources, now if I hover over any one of these sources, we can see where uh, certain things are unique. And if we take a look here, like if I hover over Flashpoint, we can see that one specific hash is unique uh, coming in from uh, Flashpoint. And if I go over to MISP, MISP actually has the one that Flashpoint has already provided, plus they provide one more uh, hash. And this hash isn't a duplicate, it's actually a new unique hash that's coming from them. They also happen to have the hash file that's coming in from Flashpoint, but because it's there, it's actually merged together and becomes one single entity. And if I then go over to Kaspersky, Kaspersky provides all three hashes, including a new one. And of course, rather than multiplying every single time that we get a new entity into the platform, the platform automatically recognizes this, correlates it, and deduplicates, which makes it so much easier for the analysts and reduces so much noise from the actual search and allows you to focus exactly on what's important. Now, before we move out of the graph, I want to show creating entities manually. Your users may want to conduct their own investigation and create the relevant entities as they go along. Perhaps they have some IP address or uh, from some internal activity they want to investigate and then we'll write a report about it. We can create new entities in a variety of different ways. Now, either we can go to the left pane here and uh, select, let's say, uh, to write a report and we'll get a pane like this. but to simplify our tasks for any analyst from within the graph itself, we can actually uh, choose to create an entity from our in-graph functionality. So if I click on create and choose to say, I'm gonna create a uh, new report, we see that uh, a report icon comes up. What I'll do is I'm gonna call this um, our COVID investigation results, hit enter. This entity has now been temporarily created. What I can do from here, of course, is if I right click, I can add relationships and instantly connect it to whatever I want uh, in the graph. And let's say I'm connecting it to the campaign, the attack pattern here, and the phishing attack, and the hash file. And I can confirm this to uh, make these relationships permanent. Of course, I'm not going to do that because that's not the case here. And of course, um, if I were to double click on this, we'll get the same pane that we saw before. Here, we already see that we've got the name in there. So the COVID investigation results, we can add a summary. We can add an analysis. We can even add a recommendation section. And you can add more information in here that you might want to have. You can add attachments, uh, have a terms of use and samples. We can save this as a draft. And uh, once we publish it, this then becomes available within the system. We can save this graph that we have, and we can add it to our workspace. And what I want to do is I want to add this to my SOC workspace. So I'm going to add it to the SOC team and click on save. This has now been added uh, to that workspace. Uh, now, since we've touched on this, let's actually go into our workspaces and discuss that for a little bit. So what you can see here is we have quite a number of different workspaces. Um, so we've explored uh, our data using the search and graph features of the platform but we want to be able to organize our data so that we don't have to search for it every single time. We do this by using workspaces in combination of data sets. Now, workspaces are as simple as the name suggests. They act as areas of, in the platform which house uh, this data. Within any one of these workspaces, if I were to select, let's say, the APT28 uh, here, for an instance, uh, I can click on uh, the Browse view. And here we see the entities that are uh, basically added to this through a data set. So if I were to go to data sets, we can see here that we have quite a few different data sets that are hooked up to this um, workspace. Each data set, again, is just predefined searches that have been saved uh, and making the life of the analyst so much easier to working uh, with these things. And of course, like I mentioned before, 
This simplifies and makes the life of an analyst so much easier by organizing and categorizing the information through workspaces and the use of data sets. So having uh, discussed workspaces and data sets and even shown you how data sets specifically work, maybe it's pertinent to show you how they actually uh, are created. Now if I go into financial crime for instance and go over to the browse and into data sets to show you what we have there, um, let us for instance click on uh, this one over here, the APT40. Uh, this is what we call a static uh, data set. Now in here nothing will change unless you uh, make that into it because these are actual uh, entities that we've input it into um, a specific data set, so a static one, when we're doing a specific investigation. As you can see here, it says, is dynamic? No. Now, if I were to close that one and open up, for instance, this one here, which is about financial crime, you can see in the search query that it's a quite complex uh, query, but it shows the power of the search feature within our platform. We can see that the search uses a grouping and Boolean operators to make logical assessments and also use tags and various different fields to precisely narrow down the search results. Now, the purpose of creating datasets is twofold. One, datasets allow your users to organize the intelligence they're working with and therefore be more efficient with their tasks and investigations. Two, datasets are funda uh, a fundamental part of any outgoing feed. So if you wish to send data to other systems or teams within your organization, this is how you would do it. This approach also allows us to implement workflows. As you can create data sets with uh, queries uh, for specific tags, your users can then apply these tags at any time, which will act as a publish mechanism. As soon as they add the tag, the entity will be exported. If you created a, uh, an outgoing feed for IOCs, and uh, plug it into a firewall, you could simply create a data set that contains only indicators like uh, IP addresses and domain names. While we're at that subject, let's go into data configuration. This platform allows us to then create incoming feeds and outgoing feeds. From what you can see here, we have quite a few incoming feeds already in the platform. And I'll show you how that exactly works. So if we were to click on the plus sign here to create a new incoming feed, we provide it with a name, provide it with an organization, uh, reliability, that's really our Admiralty code to say this is how reliable we think this specific uh, incoming feed is. Uh, and of course, that's based on our own experience. In terms of transport types, we have quite a few uh, different integrations in place. Anything from uh, Cisco to CrowdStrike, uh, Digital Shadows, FireEye, Flashpoint, all of the big uh, known ones. And of course, should you have a threat intelligence feed that's a bit more, let's say, exotic uh, that uh, we haven't thought about, you can always use TaxiPoll as long as it's um, a sticks based uh, feed. Now, and we obviously support up to sticks 2.1. And of course, if you have anything that isn't and requires even more attention, then we can always uh, use the uh, uh, software development kit that we have for you to be able to uh, build an extension for that. And should you not be able to, we could help you with that as well. Now, once you've set these parameters here, uh, you can go down and select uh, everything from uh, ingesting start date. Uh, so when do you want the um, threat intelligence feed to start ingesting? We can schedule to show how often we want this to be updated per minute, per hour, or specific times per day. Uh, and of course, we have the concept of half-life. So let's assume that an indicator has come into the platform and it's been there for 90 days. Anything uh, older than that, we're basically telling the system, exclude that from, the, uh, from our search. Now, this doesn't mean that uh, the entity is being deleted or archived. No, it just means that's going to be excluded to reduce the amount of uh, noise that an analyst sees. And of course, should the analyst want to expand the search even further, they can always do that uh, through the Lucent search query. So, that's our incoming feeds and how we get information in. Now, talking about outgoing feeds and how that relates to the data sets, here we can see other outgoing feeds that we have in terms of stuff that we're sending to clients, uh, stuff that we might be sending back to Splunk or to QRadar. Uh, I can show you just by clicking the plus sign, similar to how we created the incoming feeds. Uh, we can basically call this a firewall uh, IP update. Oh, let's remove the O. Here we choose the transport type again, so we could choose to send it in a taxi poll, uh, choose the content type that we want to send it in, and uh, we can from here. These are then the data sets that we've created. So every single data set that's available in the system will be found in here. And uh, all you have to do is let's say we type IP, and uh, this is an asset watch list for IP addresses. So these are 
uh, data sets that we've created with specific search queries based on what we're looking here. So we're going to create a threat intelligence feed that's outgoing with high confidence IP addresses. So we're going to click on this one. Then we can just type IP again. And we're going to send this uh, uh, asset watch list as well. So this way, we've created a feed that's going to a firewall with only IP addresses that are of high confidence. We're basically saying these are IP addresses we want to watch or these are IP addresses we want to block. Uh, and similarly, here we can choose between who's being able to send it from or who can receive it. Uh, we can give it a collection name. Uh, again, we can schedule how often this is uh, going to be sent in terms of minutes, hours, days. Uh, and then we can choose uh, the enrichment uh, protocols and what observables that we want to send across. We also have the concept of anonymization. So let's assume, for instance, that uh, we have something coming in for a company called NBD, for instance. Rather than sending that to our constituents, we want to change that to, I don't know, let's say uh, FT233. Oops, there we go. So that basically means anything that's coming in, uh, if there's a mention of NBD, or if we change this from NBD to, let's say, Nike, then uh, it changes all of that for us in the feed and then sends it across in the outgoing feeds with the value that we replace it with. So let's do a quick recap before we move to part two. We have seen that all data is normalized and structured in the open standard sticks that allows you to correlate different sources, even if they use different aliases like APT28 and Fancy Bear as it was initially called by Maniant or Panstorm, Sophacy Group or as Kaspersky called them, Setnet, Tsar Team, by FireEye, etc. All these vendors, and there are about 14 more commercial vendors, have different data formats and conventions and different views. Same for the many open sources. With the Eclectic IQ platform, you structure them in the unified sticks format that allows you to create a holistic view and allows flexible use and secure not losing content or context when sharing with others. The platform has a catalog of pre-existing integrations, so analysts can use data without hassle of data engineering. And if that's not enough, they can use Sticks or the System Development Kit and make their own integrations or even extensions to the platform. The rich graphical analysis workbench, also based on Sticks, helps analysts understanding threads faster and understand the full picture, helps them to investigate at new contexts and entities and produce a relevant and actionable intelligence beyond IOCs. You've also seen the workspaces. Workspaces are containers or collections of data within the full knowledge base and help you to organize your intelligence along teams or along thread topics or categories, such as campaigns or certain technologies, or along thread categories and scenarios you might have defined in your risk management program. And as such, support you creating the connection between your information security program, risk management program, and threat intelligence program. The workspaces are built on static and dynamic datasets, supporting collaboration between the different teams and stakeholders in your organization, and in particular, the dynamic datasets reduce the intelligence analyst workload significantly. In the second demo, we will follow a scenario with a sighting coming from a shim. In this case, Plunk, it starts with tasks, then the details about the sighting, the investigation and use of the graph analysis for this purpose, and to understand the full picture, and finally using the outcome for mitigation and for deeper analysis by another team member. So we've discussed workspaces, datasets, how they work together with each other, uh, how we categorize information for incoming and outgoing feeds, uh, and essentially we've also discussed about uh, how we search for information, how we can add context to that by uh, investigating further on the graph. But what about if we've got uh, something coming in through a seam, so let's say a sighting or so? How would we deal with that? Now, to do that, let's just go and take a look at the dashboard again. There are two widgets here I want to uh, let you notice and look at. This is the task uh, widgets. So basically, we can create tasks for ourselves our colleagues or other people in the organization when there's an, when you know whenever there's something that we want to uh, take a look at if we're going to tell them listen there's a task that needs to be done or there's a job that needs to be investigated could you please take a look 
In this specific case, I do have one that's assigned to myself, and it says investigate sighting. So if I were to click on it, I get a very simple information at the top saying uh, a hash was detected uh, in an email attachment. Um, and I see that it's in the workspace uh, SOC team. I also see that there's a, a, a citing Splunk activity for hash. So if I were to click on that, I basically get the same investigation window as before. So, you know, the just the pane with more information in there. What I want to do is I'll click on Add to Graph. So this is going to add it to a new graph that I've got open here. And from here, we can investigate further. So from here, again, I can just double click on this uh, and read what else is there. Uh, so analysis that was done by somebody else basically tell me this is a hash of a file detected as a file attachment in an email received. Uh, I can click on the observables to see what's there. And of course, it'll only show me the hash at this moment because that's what's there. Uh, I can click on neighborhood. It'll show me that, hey, there's a little bit more information in there. So rather than creating a new graph this time, I'm just going to load it into this graph. And if I do that, going, I'm going straight from one sighting from Splunk that shows me a hash. It also shows me uh, other hashes that are available here. Uh, there's a report, and there's also CLOP, which is a known uh, uh, you know, IOC. Uh, if I were to open the report, look at it through, there's a lot of details that have been discussed here about um, <clears throat> essentially everything from uh, how the files are locked, uh, to the uh, batch files that are used, uh, to the registry keys that are available, etc. So it's quite uh, detailed. However, that's not the only information that we can gather from this. I mean, if I were to click on observables here, it'll show me from the report what is actually found. And this is a plethora of information, everything from URLs that have been compromised, uh, their deployment methods, etc. So what I would want to do, I could click on neighborhood here and basically select it to load everything. But what I'm going to do first off is I could just go ahead and say, uh, I don't know, load TTP, show me what's there. And it shows me uh, the malware variant for CLOP. Um, I can also say if I'm specifically looking for a threat actor, can you show me if there's any threat actors involved? Yes, there's the TA505 uh, and also the intrusion set. Now the intrusion set itself explains quite a lot about uh, the actors themselves, often uh, the utilities that they use. And from there, we can also click on observables, of course, and we see that this is the actor ID that's there. Uh, and from there, we can uh, basically load this into the open graph, and suddenly we have a huge amount of information that's come up. Essentially, what we're going from is we're going from one single sighting that we started with that shows us a uh, hash. And uh, from this hash file, we're basically linking to the CLOP ransomware. We know that through the information that we have, that uh, this is basically something from TA505. And by expanding that further, not only are we getting uh, information such as the attack patterns that they have, but we're also seeing uh, other stuff like, uh, for instance, Friend Speak, uh, a campaign that was ongoing with other uh, indicators here. This also tells us about all the different URLs that are currently uh, used for uh, deployment, for instance, because sometimes you'll have one of the attack methods that they actually have their deployment package hosted somewhere else that they could use to push through. And this is essentially just one way of going from a single sighting that comes in from Splunk or Curator or any one of the big uh, players that integrates into our platform. And we go from there to a hash to a huge context of information that allows us to understand, OK, this is what's ongoing. And again, from here, we could, of course, uh, create a report. Or let's say that we have something that we want to uh, do about this. So we have information in terms of course of action. What are we going to do to stop this from uh, actually infecting us? Because we know from here the different tools that, they're, uh, that they can use. We also know the IP addresses uh, that uh, they have the deployments in. What would be beneficial is we could create uh, a course of action where we're basically saying all of these IP addresses that are currently seen or known to be uh, used by this uh, group, we want them to be blocked from the firewall. We want to send information over to our SOC team or incident response team to basically uh, investigate this further. And of course, this is what we can do here. So to finish this off, it'd be interesting to see how we would be able to select uh, certain hashes and entities just to be able to say, we want somebody to actually investigate this further uh, rather than just adding it to a workspace, which of course is always uh, the right way to go as well. But let's say we want to select these five entities here. We'll right click, go to create a task, and we can add information here as in uh, further investigate uh, investigation needed for entities and report. And we want this to be uh, to see what the relevance is to CLOP. Uh, we see here that uh, attached entities, which ones uh, they are. And if I were to click on save, this task will be 
generated and added to the tasks available on the system. So having created the task, uh, we can go back to our dashboard just to see uh, what that looks like. So you can see here that uh, my open tasks have changed from two uh, out of four to three out of four. You can see that the task is here indeed. So if I click on that, we can see that it's actually been created. It's added to the workspace uh, SOC team. I can see uh, uh, the stakeholders that are involved in here. And also, of course, uh, the entities that we've chosen to add here. We can always add a comment in here to, uh, to say, um, uh, whatever we want. So let's basically say one of the constituents actually, or sorry, one of the uh, stakeholders is in here and he's basically saying, um, uh, let's say task received will investigate in an hour. This will essentially add the, ta uh, the comment that we've uh, wanted. We can also remove it should we want to change it or edit it from here. And of course, anything new coming in, we can also see who it is that's actually adding the uh, comment to the task. So now you have seen both demos, let's summarize. In both scenarios, we demonstrated Eclectic IQ Platform as the full analyst-centric cyber threat intelligence workbench for proactive as well as responsive intelligence requests. It is made by analysts for analysts and increases the productivity of analysts by enabling them to do what they love to do, analysis. And by automation, strong graph analysis collaboration and rich integration capabilities delivering actionable intelligence to drive faster responses. This enables you aligning your security effort to the reality of your threat exposure. If you want to know more, there is a very nice collection of artifacts, papers about cyber threat intelligence in general and how to set up your practice or, for instance, a path to achieving actionable intelligence. Of course, papers about the products and value-added services we have and a lot of blogs and videos ranging from the Eclectic IQ Monthly Vulnerability Trend Report and the weekly Eclectic IQ Pandemic Intelligence Update, also known as the COVID-19 blog, as well as specific topics related to ransomware, critical infrastructure, getting the most out of threat intelligence ingestion, cert or incident handling processes, or whiteboard sessions with our CEO, Joop Gommers, for instance, about an agile approach to CTI. You can find them via our website or just sending me an email. With that, thank you very much for attending this session. We are looking forward to hearing from you or meeting you in a virtual booth for questions you might have and or your feedback on this presentation. We are always keen to hear from people in the threat intelligence or wider information security and risk management fields their view how, together, we can make the world a little bit more cyber secure. Thank you again. And have a nice day.